We're going to kick our, our day off um, with a pre-recorded video presentation that I, I mentioned yesterday um, from from Palika, uh, who was uh, meant to be here. Uh, she's a native Hawaiian, born and raised on the island of uh, Kauai. Um, she's the founder and executive director of Namaka Onaona, uh, a Hawaii-based non-profit and extension agent for the University of Hawaii Sea Grant Challenge uh, program. Um, she's uh, unable to be here um, as uh, uh, she was uh, heading up north, and she needed to. Um, what was it? What was it? She was she she wasn't able to go anywhere else before she headed up there for quarantine reasons. So hence the reason she wasn't able to come down and join us uh, here in Aotearoa. So we're going to start off by uh, by watching her presentation um, right now. Aloha kako. O vau peliko kamana o io Andrade. No pila ako wa imayao, aka na e, wa hana e ia yau. Ena vahi amena aina like ole mahava ine. Hele aloha mahalo ke ia. No ke ako ko mai ke aha o te o te moana. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Aloha kako. My name is Pelika Andrade. I'm from Hawaii. I'm from a small little island, Kauai, uh, from the Ahupua of Pila'a. But I would like to also acknowledge all of the places and communities that have raised me. I would also like to mahalo each and every one of you for attending this conference. Te ao te moana. Aloha kako apo. So I am going to share my screen right now. Let's just take a little pause and share it and hopefully we get the right screen. And I am just going to do a check with everybody to see if you can see what I'm seeing. Thank you very much. So again, my name is Pelika Andrade from Hawaii and thank you for having me today to share my journey of the work that I do and the work that has found me at this title, Pilina, Indigenous Literacy in Aino Momona. Like every journey, there is a common thread or a vessel, and that has been Nakilo Aina, so, which is the broader umbrella program that I run. And I'm gonna talk about I, I'm gonna talk about me, I'm gonna talk about we, and all of it is because there's this collective journey that a lot of us have shared to get to where we are today. So like many words in our language, the translation to English is not, not easy, but just bear with me and we're gonna try to get through this. So kilo, I think the equivalent in, in Maori is titiro possibly. And for us means to observe, but it's not a simple observation. It means to observe, read a story, receive the story and start to make decisions to inform our lives. So kilo is, is this beautiful journey that we take in reading our environment, listening to places, listening to our natural resources, so we can start to make decisions on how we live. Aina is, in Hawaii, is very commonly used to um, refer to land. And it is land, but it's so much more than that. Aina and the breakup of the word ka'aiana means to feed and to sustain yourself. So when we use aina, specifically my program and our program, it's referring to everything that feeds us. And we're talking about the feeding of our bodies, our minds and our spirits, right? So emotional, mental, um, physical, spiritual feedings. So our aina bases, if you will, are all of those things. We are aina because we feed and are fed. Our churches, our heyo, our marae, our schools, our community members, our organizations, all of these are aina. And the beautiful thing about aina is that it exists within re reciprocity. So aina are the things that feed us, but are dependent on the relationship of reciprocity. It gives what it gets. And we give what we get and we get what we give. Um, and there's this beautiful relationship that, that we carry when we talk about aina. And that's, that's the relationship that we wanna really stress here um, in our programs. Every journey has a destination, and I think it's really, really important for us to point out these destinations and really start to vision towards something. 
a lot of us in our indigenous communities, I, I know here in Hawaii, there we have all of this trauma, if you will, behind us. And we, we're so worried about what we don't want to happen. We start to vision against our past. And I think it's really important for our people to vision towards a future. And the future that we envision for Nakilo Aina is this idea of Alahula Aina Momona. Alahula is a path well trodden, a highway, if you will, and Aina, all the things that feed us. Momona means fat and succulent and sweet. And it really boils down for, for us in, in this idea of thriving and productive communities of people, place, and, not, and our natural resources as they are a part of our broader communities. So along this journey, we've kind of highlighted a bunch of, a bunch of things that kind of just make us what we are. Pilina, relationships, they are at the foundation of everything that we do. Um, you, can't do you can't do anything without relationships and understanding the role that relationships plays in our lives. So even though we lean into a lot of natural resource management and research, and we do a lot of aina land and ocean work, we also have to recognize the fact that our relationships with each other are really important to tend and keep along the journey. So we work with young kids, we work with um, parents, we work with kupuna, we work with all ages. And as simple as spending time together is really, really important. Because as you build these relationships, you start to build the capacity to have conversations. You build the capacity to see the world. You have the capacity for that kilo that we talked about um, a little earlier. The other, the other strong component of na kilo aina is being present and paying attention. And it's really interesting. All of these things are really, really simple, but the, but in the world that we live in today, we, we somehow bypass the, simp the simple things because we don't think they're important, but actually they are the most important. So being present and paying attention together, um, not separately, um, is something that we really infuse into our programs because we can always be there, but if we're not paying attention, then we miss, we miss a lot. And again, right, that relationship determines how you are present and how you pay attention. And if you can think about this idea of, of being in a place for a really, really long time. So um, everybody think about the school that you've been at, um, college or high school, four years you spent there. And how many of you can tell me about the plant people and the, and the winds and the rains and the clouds and when, when these plants flowered or when they blew, um, when they seeded or fruited or when the birds came in and when they changed their feathers, et cetera, right? So just because we're present, it doesn't necessarily mean you're paying attention. So there's this conscious, conscious action that has to happen while we're in place. And again, it's all based on relationships. So growing that relationship at the same time. The other concept that is really, really important is taking mana'o lana and turning it into mana'o i'o. So mana'o is thoughts and ideas. Lana means to float and i'o means flesh. So it's kind of like doing stuff, yeah? We have another olala um, no ea or a saying here in Hawaii, makahana ka ike, in doing you know. Um, again, words, right? Words have power, they have visual power. So the mana'o lana, the, the envision thoughts that float about us. And these are the theories and all the ideas that we have, and they're really, really valuable, but they become extra valuable when you do them over and over and over again until the flesh knows it. And then these ideas start to transform and change relationships. And then, and then the journey continues, right? So if you look at the upper left-hand corner, we have these boys. What they're doing is they're building a dam in our manowai on the intake for our lo'i, our traditional taro fields. And, you know, now they recognize how hard it is to just to, just to divert some water for, the, for, for agriculture. But now they're asking questions about where water comes from, how important the upper watershed is, right? The, the native biodiversity up there and collecting water and retaining it into our aquifers and our surface, our surface waters. Our boys in the middle, they're repairing a hale lolu, which is um, a palm hale, thatched hale. And lolu aren't as, um, they're not everywhere that they used to grow. So there's the simple task of thatching, it's not simple, Forgive me, but 
outside of thatching this hale, now they're starting to ask questions about where do these lolu grow? How important, what are the other functions of lolu in our communities? So, so the doing um, starts to again, deepen, broaden and establish these, these relationships that build the capacity for us to, to engage in our spaces. Oh, I can't leave out the, um, the two to the right, they're collecting salt. So we have a rich tradition of salt collection here in Hawaii. And if you've never collected salt before, you have all of these ideas of how salt is collected. But as soon as you start to collect them, over half of it is wrong. So it's really important to engage in the doing and let your body and let your flesh know it. It changes your whole perspective and your relationship. Another component that is really, really important in this journey is making their realities yours and vice versa. A lot of the work we do in community and in research includes a lot of users. We have fishers, we have hunters, we have family members, we have parents, kupuna. All of these different roles have different realities within the same space. And it's really, really important, especially for, for people that are advising um, and are inquiring and doing research that affect all of our users and our community members to put their, themselves in the places of the people that their decisions and their finds, if you will, affect. But once you start doing that, right, what happens? You brought in relationship, you start to understand. You start to understand how important it is for a family to feed themselves. Right? It changes how you'd make decisions, how you use information. Our boys here on the right making an emu, um, how important it is in all of the steps of collection, where things grow, how they gather, the amount of effort that goes into it, that all changes your relationship and changes again how you engage with your places. This also grows our vocabulary. Again, we're talking about indigenous literacy. I'll get into that later, but just remember that engaging in others' realities and making their realities yours will help grow that vocabulary. That'll get too soon. Another component of Nakilo Aina is utilizing multiple knowledge systems and tools. And I really wanna stress here that STEM does not belong to the Western world every culture out there, including Hawaii, including Maori, including Tahiti and all of our cultures around the world, we all have STEM. But we all have to recognize that STEM is a tool. It's a way to inquire about the world around us. How, do, how did we build? How did we engage? What drove STEM and drove those inquiries were set on a different thing. And that was the values that we held in our families and in our communities. They're two very different things, right? But, but STEM, whether it's indigenous, whether it's Western or institutional, they're great tools to help us solve those larger problems of, again, where do we wanna go? So we measure things, we teach people how to measure things. And how does that now fit into, how do those stories now fit into the stories that we're trying to find and trying to tell? And last but not least, it's about revisiting and redefining our narratives and beliefs. Understanding that there's a story. So what's the story? And also, who does it belong to? So I really want you guys to take a, like, a, a few seconds and look at these four pictures. One, two, three, and four. They're the same piece of the shoreline and different times of the year. And I want you to tell me which, or think, because you can't tell me, um, Think about which one looks healthy. So I'm gonna give you a second, look at all the pictures. Is it one, is it two, is it three, is it four? Which one's healthy? So about five years ago, if I asked anybody this, everybody said two. Everybody looked at that shoreline, all oh, the limo growing on it, looking so lush. And they're like, two, two is healthy. The answer is all are healthy. All pictures are healthy. They're just in a different kind of cycle and phase of the year, right? So again, whose story is healthy and who does it belong to, right? What's that story look like? And again, as a manager, as someone who works in fisheries a lot, if I had gone into the shoreline during one, expecting to see two as healthy, what kind of damage am I making? What kind of decisions am I making that are working against 
what naturally is supposed to be happening and acknowledging that. So there's other stories that we have in our communities. There's other narratives and beliefs that we need to start looking at and looking at who does it belong to? We have smart, we have poor, we have disadvantaged. Sorry, I didn't make the time things to come up so I don't know when it's gonna come up and when, when it's not. So I'm pressing buttons. We have productive and production, right? And we also have literacy or illiterate. So healthy, we've talked about smart. What is intelligence, right? Who gauges that and who measures that and whose story is that? I have a lot of friends that think they're not smart. They're really, really intelligent, but because one system has told them for 13 years that they didn't score high and they didn't take tests well, then bad grades, this has changed their story for the rest of their life. So how do we, how do we address that? And excuse me, where I live, it's motorcycle country, so you're gonna get this once in a while. The other things are poor and disadvantaged. And I know from Modi in, in Hawaii, we, we, we have these words used against us. And then we start to use these words against us, right? What is poor and disadvantaged and to who? We had two guest speakers at, um, at a talk I went to talking about how their grandparents were poor and disadvantaged and they were spending their whole careers to help their people get out of the state of poor disadvantage. And then they started to define what poor and disadvantaged was and that their grandparents had to wake up really early in the morning and had to go down to the river and get their own water and walk it home and then slop the pigs, feed the animals, clean stuff, right? And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, that's like the best life ever, right? So again, who's poor and who's disadvantaged, right? Isn't that what we dream of for our grandchildren? Well, I know I, I dream that for my grandchildren when I, when I get them. Productive, production. Who's, if you didn't do four or five reports, are you not productive, right? Again, like this shoreline, there's different states of production. They all look different. And I don't believe in non-productive states. I joke with people, my marathon, my Netflix marathon, I'm super productive, right? My 10 hours going for it for Netflix. My brain needs to rest. My body needs to rest, right? I need to shut it off for a little bit and it feeds me in some way. It adds to my, my whole production capacity, right? And then literacy. Let's get into literacy and being illiterate. So for years and years and years, we've been told, especially in Western education, that, that um, we are illiterate, our people are illiterate, and we need to become more literate, and we can't read and write, reading and writing, reading and writing, right? And that's really important. I'm not saying it's not valuable. I'm not saying it's not important. But when you think about literacy, and everyone's using it now for economics and for ocean literacy and Aina literacy and all of these things. Literacy is just the ability to read and receive information and then share it out in a really clear way. So who's, when we talk about literacy and we talk about our people, were they able to receive information and share it out in a clear, concise way? And absolutely. And so I'm referring to this as indigenous literacy excuse me, the ability to read our landscapes and access the knowledge repositories of our landscapes. And now who's illiterate? And I, right, our kupuna, we're not illiterate. We are kind of a little bit illiterate right now, right? We can't read that library anymore. And so here's the thing, right? We just flip the script a little bit. Our kupuna, we're absolutely literate. And what does that literacy and illiteracy mean to us now, right? How, whose story are we reading? Are we able to read the landscapes and our libraries? So this is an encouragement to become fluent again and be able to receive those, th that information. So we were, again, in all ways, we have been left instructions by our kupuna. But again, right, we're not literate. We don't know how to make the story fit. We don't know how to put things where they belong. 
And along this journey, I've been doing this for about 15 years consciously, right? I'm a little older than 15, but 15 years I've been really looking at this stuff. And I've, I've again, simple, super, super simple within the context of season, moon cycles, our places, our lifestyles, and us as individuals and us as a community, we have these instructions. We just need to learn how to, um, to, to balance the equation, if we will. So here's a really, really simple um, example of, of some instructions they left us. So we all know this, right? Seasons happen, things happen within season. And then this huge movement about moon phases, right? Certain things were happening in moon phases. But when I was being told that this moon phase was happening, so we're gonna see this low tide at this time, go do this. I spent a lot of time at the ocean and I was just like starting to call BS on all of the stuff because I'm like, no, it's that moon, but I'm not seeing that, right? Like, again, I was raised very, very um, different, right? To think about all of these things and push back on these ideas until it made sense to me. So that was, that, that's my, um, I guess, gift to the world, if you will. So in order to share this, I want, I, I kind of just took this tide calendar, cut it up, put it up. So this is Hawaii's tide chart. And if you can see, I kind of just really took, looked at it for about 20 minutes and circled different trends that I picked out or non-trends that I picked out. And you can see that there are um, red and green circles. So those are extreme highs and extreme lows. So those extreme highs only happen on new and full moons in the winter and summer, right? We have high tides and we have low tides all across the year. Across these moons, the difference between high and low are far apart. So that's the similarity across the year. But seasonally, we're not getting the extremes. It's in winter. And then it swaps. And it happens in the afternoons during summer. Right? So we're not going to see this moon always having a high tide in the morning. That swaps throughout the year. And this other really, really cool thing, my scientific word is mushing, right? In our ole moons, right? In our quarter moons, like first and uh, third quarter moons, our two high tides join and make one really long tide, high tide and one really low long tide. So we're not getting two and two. We're getting one really long and one really short. And it's only happening in spring and fall in our quarter moons. And this true mushing only happens twice. Once in spring in the first quarters and once in fall in the second quarters. They happen a little bit in the opposites, but not that complete true mushing. Yeah, you like my word, Ja. So ancestral instructions, we have them laid out, but we have to make sense of it, right? We have to apply it and we have to make sure that we aren't only regurgitating what our kupuna said, we're not supposed to see what they saw, right? Our climate's changing, our community members are changing. There's so much change. It changed for them over thousands of years. What we're supposed to see is how they saw, not what they saw, right? They understood that there were cycles and they recalibrated to it. We understand that there are cycles, can't recalibrate to it. So we developed a tool to help us do this. This is called Huli'ia, it's to help us track seasons. It's letting a place, you know, that library, that knowledge repository, contribute to its own narrative. Like, how is that? How many of you look outside, see the rain squall coming, but because the news said not going to rain today, you don't believe it until it hits you, right? Most of us do that. We see it with our own eyes, but we won't believe it until this technology reconfirms or tells us. And then when it happens, we're surprised, right? This is the literacy part, like having to trust that again and letting a place contribute and trust the con contribution. So that's the indigenous literacy I'm talking about. A record, so this is where we split in what the goal is. The record is not the goal. The byproducts are you and me. I, and that's just a byproduct, excuse me. The product is you and me. How do we become better listeners? How do we become more literate? We're gonna get the data. That's the, that's the beautiful byproduct. 
But if we focus on how do we increase our memories? How do we become more literate? How do we become indigenous literate communities again, right? So Juli'ia is helping to build memory and creating conversations, growing capacity to be aware, to be literate again, building our vocabulary. Remember that other slide back there? Realities, right? Broadening realities, broaden our vocabulary. Because those hunters and those fishermen, they're way more literate than us. Let me tell you, way more literate than us. What Julia looks like. So we meet monthly, once, maybe twice in a lunar month. We have a group activity and a group discussion talking about dominant behaviors of your place. And because we live in a contemporary world where we jet across the world and we jet through with our cars all over, we bring those conversations in because now our communities are a little bit broader than before. We only want to talk about what we ike maka, what our bodies have seen, what we've touched, tasted, felt. And then we recalibrate to each other. So is this cold to you? Nah, it's not cold to me. Oh, it's cold to you, okay. And then we find, find a word to describe that cold or not cold. We try not to connect cause and effect because sometimes what we think is happening is not what's really happening. They're just coincidences and they're related, but not directly. So we wanna find out what the missing pieces are. Sometimes they totally are connected and the reason, but then we miss the in-betweens if there are. And we have one collective record. What Juli'ia does not look like. So this goes against, again, the academia, right? I, I, I really um, push back against journals and data sheets that are individual. Because what happens when you do an individual journal? You write in it and you forget it and you put it away and you never look at it again, unless you're like really, really good. But most people don't do that, right? And then we forget. So I would rather people walk away really knowing five things than writing down a hundred and not remembering any. And then I don't designate kilo times. So this is the killer. Because when you designate a time to observe, guess what happens? You're telling your mind that there are times to not observe. How's that, right? So when you tell yourself that we're gonna sit down on Mondays at nine o'clock to observe, guess what you're gonna do for the other 23 hours on Monday and the rest of the week? You're not looking and paying attention to anything really. So that's Julia. This is our like old sheet from like 15 years ago. And it's just to help facilitate the question. This is not enough room anymore and it's grown to be different. And then we start to record all of these things. You get all of these stories come about, right? Flowering, shoreline smells, um, limu patches, um, some of our fish having gonads. And again, we're not supposed to see what they saw. We're supposed to see how they saw. And then we be have another instruction from our kupuna, these olelo no ea. We have these little bits of wisdom that get pushed to us. Palakahala momona kaha uke uke. And I think you have putakawa and kena, right? In Aotearoa, right? Are they wisdom? Or are they just something you say? And my response to that is if they are not your storytellers, they are just something you say. So go get some wisdom. If these guys are not your storytellers, who are? That's the point of this. That's the ancestral instruction. And I'm gonna keep going because I only have five minutes left. Okay, so we have some more storytellers nowadays. <laughs> The big crashing waves are storytellers to go down and get um, limu pahe'e, which is, I think, paringo in Aotearoa. The limu, I'm getting a yes. So we have it here, but not like the big, beautiful stuff you have down there. Ours comes in like two or three months, little gaps in the when we have really, really rough weather and cold and, um, and a little bit of rain. And then we have ho'ea maika eva eva ko koke kaha alele ano na mea ho'uilo. And the ever ever or the city turn when they arrive, our winter will be gone and it's moving on and summer will be here. And then we have these beautiful images and visual stories of two of our places that we've completed. Um, and we're working with more, with more places now, um, trying to get, to get some captures and build, build the storytellers of our places and give them their voice. So that's our season. So once we got to our seasons, we're like, okay, we're ready for moons. But moons is a personal journey too. Seasons are as well. But there's this beautiful thing when we started to look at the title charts, we're like, ah, oh, 
productivity. What does that look like? And what do those charts look to us personally? If we're going to consider ourselves Aina, then what does that look like? So with a friend of mine, um, Naya, we created these, these journals. What is your personal star and narrative with the moon? And are there really productive times? And then how do we track that and understand that more? So we have these open spreads in it. We have every single moon phase represented and those are different seasons where you can journal. So on a new moon, excuse me, we call it Hilo. You can change it out if you want. In the season that we're in and we're in Velo right now here in Hawaii, at the end of the day, I would write in Velo, oh, I'm so tired today. I'm exhausted, right? I'd write all the things. And I'll be really, really descriptive and honest about it. And then if you can see to the right, there's those numbers. And this is, I don't know, I, got, I get really geeky when it comes to like graphing things. And I thought this was really exciting. So we thought we wanted to quantitatively be able to create our own, our own title, um, title charts, right? So kino is physical energy, manao, mental clarity, na'au, emotional resiliency. And then I also wanted to track gender cycles, attraction, universal attraction. You know, like when the world is against you or the world is for you, hit every red light, get in a car accident, someone yells at you. Yeah, those days, they're a cycle, by the way. And then how we feel about our bodies. And then going from zero to six, going three normal, Remember those extreme highs that we saw in winter and summer, giving zeros and sixes, those opportunities to get extreme. And I tracked myself and a whole bunch of others. And this is my graph. This is my title charts. Because I share it because I, I want you guys to do this. So I got to be honest with everybody. And what I found was that there are three states that I find myself in. And as I talk to more people, we all kind of share this. I'm going to speed through this because I only have a minute and a half left. So we all have this cocky window, we all have this stewing window, and we have this stars align window. There's some other things in there, but that's the common thread that I find with all the people that I talk to, right? All my numbers are up. I have a lot of energy. I'm super mentally clear, off the charts. Don't argue with me. And I'm emotionally resilient. Like If I lose, I don't care, right? And then my numbers go down, and I'm a little bit more sensitive and precious, right? But nothing makes sense, and I just kind of go clean my house or go for walks or do the media, like the mundane tasks. And then the stars start to align, and then I can write my report or I can do my critical thinking, right? So there's these beautiful windows, and if we can figure that out, then where where can we where can we go with this? And then this is some of those journals, right? Slow and steady, move slow. And then here's in my cocky, right? Feeling myself getting punchy, smart ass and a little bit playful, naughty, right? So no entries because who wants to write when they're feeling cocky, right? So what does this mean? How does this increase capacity and insight, understanding cycles, optimizing actions, optimizing the success of ourselves and families, our communities? How does this guide our inquiry by understanding the, the system of and what our kupuna have passed to us, right? What kind of inquiries are we having? Are we only looking at these little slices of things? Are we going to broaden it out and look at these systems of production and the potential of that? And then how does that change our practice? How do these relationship changes change our practice? How do we revisit our narratives and beliefs, reset our relationships, recalibrate to the world around us? And then how are we, re are we reading the libraries accurately? Are we allowing our kupuna, our akua, our natural resources to tell their story? Excuse me. And are we listening? So I hope this opens more doors and of, of, of possibilities. I hope we can all lean into listening more. I hope we are once again fluent in the language of our lands, oceans, and communities. Thank you. Mahalo.